you so much because my talk is like an intermezzo. I will talk about uh, symmetry and things like that. And I am chairman of nothing. And I will not discuss the so beautiful impact of you here today. So uh, please take that as some kind of uh, uh, a short journey we, are, we will do in studying together the notion of symmetry. By the way, Abdelmalek, I thought it was much too long, so I just wrote symmetry and crystallography. Uh, that means that I am not specially attached to discuss the n-dimensional aspect, but you'll see it is in there. Uh, my outline is very simple. There are three questions. Which tool should we use for studying symmetries? The answer is absolutely trivial. It's group theory. But I would like to show to you a few aspects of group theory that are not so well known in crystallography, but makes life much easier when you look at theory, group theory using group action theory. My second point is which space? In which space do we uh, learn about symmetry best? And as uh, everyone knows, again, I will show that it is in reciprocal space, not in direct space. Of course, direct space is fundamental if you make structural determination to do it in, in real space. But as far as symmetries are concerned, reciprocal space is best. Now, if I am in reciprocal space, the question is to say what is a fivefold or threefold, whatever symmetry you want, in reciprocal space? What does it mean in real space? Does it mean a superimposition or something else? So we will see that this, uh, the meaning of studying symmetry in reciprocal space will change the mean physical meaning. It will become indecibility groups. And my last topic is what next? Uh, are there cases where uh, all these notions we will discuss now uh, just failed, are not uh, adequate? And you'll see uh, a few examples, at least one example, where I'm totally ignorant of what is going on. So don't ask me what it means. I don't know. But uh, maybe people here know. First of all, why group theory is coming into the story right away. If we talk about symmetry, we talk about invariance. We take some object, we change it, and it superimposes exactly. It is invariant. If you do it twice, it is invariant twice. That means that the product of two symmetry elements is a, a symmetry element. That means it is a group. So symmetry invariant group theory, trivial. Just for fun, for your old, maybe for us, for some of you, old souvenir, I would say, what a group is. A group is a set with an internal law, and it has a closure property, associativity property, an identity element, an inverse, each element has an inverse element. Uh, the point I want just to emphasize, there is only a few transparencies of that, of course, is that uh, how do we see a group? A group is a table of multiplication. It's nothing but that for mathematicians. You have, for example, here E, A, B, C as being four elements. Well, okay. Uh, uh -uh. Yeah, here, for example, this is a group. Uh, we don't use group like that. That is totally useless. What we use is a representation of groups on a certain space. Let's call it M, that space. But it's not directly on the space. It's uh, on all the operations that leaves that space invariant. That's called automorphism. So the group action is making a correspondence, which I call phi here, between G, which is this table, and the automorphism of M. For example, if M is R3, or space, automorphism of R are just all the isometries. But G and M can be totally different things. Uh, the point very important is that if A and B are two elements of G, for example, here is A is, is B, and that the table says as it's a product of A by B gives C. So you have rules, A by B gives a given one. That's a group. On the other way, you have the homomorphism, which I call phi here. The point's very important is that if A, B gives C, then 
Fie Phoebe gives phi C. That means that phi should satisfy the multiplication table. Let me give you examples, very simple ones, and then we start going something interesting. Here I take as M one number, number one. What is the automorphism of M? What, what kind of operation leaves one invariant? The multiplication by one. If I multiply one by one, I get one. What are the correspondence between E, A, B, and C on this set? If I uh, make phi be, being one for E, for A, for B, and C, of course the multiplication table is satisfied. For any case, one pi by one is equal to one. So this is what's called trivial representation. Now I can take some M more interesting. Plus one and minus one. There's two numbers. What are the automorphisms of these two numbers? Multiplication by one and by minus one. Uh, and I can make now the correspondence with phi here being one for E, minus one for A, one for B, and minus one for C. And if I look at this table, for example, A by B is equal to C, one, uh, minus one multiplied by one is equal to minus one. Again, here, the table of multiplication does correspond perfectly to uh, the, the, the set uh, of attributed here, phi, A, phi, B, and so on. There is another one, 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 bar one, bar one. Here, if you take that, it follows perfectly the table of multiplication. If you take this one, also it, what you see here it are the four irreducible, one-dimensional irreducible representation of MM2, for example. But it's just for fun. What I wanted to show you here is that the way you represent groups is not only linear representation, but any representation. Let's check one. Uh, Isometries in Rn, trivial. This is now, phi j will be gt. Uh, these are the isometries. Uh, I take a point here, apply g on it, and then translate by t. Uh, if you go to reciprocal space, there is very convenient writing also. It is less used. Uh, if I take a q vector, which for me is a bra, like a bracket in, in quantum mechanics, it's, it's a state, it's exponential i uh, q r. Uh, the application of GT, you see that I, I put a, a hat on it because it, it is in Fourier space. It's take Q, multiply by this phase factor, JQ, and go point things along direction JQ. Uh, uh, this writing here is exactly equivalent to that one. It's less used, but very, very efficient for calculations just in it. Another one. You have a phase transformation for a large group, G, uh, to down to a smaller group, H. For example, here, uh, this is an order-disorder transition in metals, in, in alloys, uh, copper palladium, where you had a group at high temperature, which was FM3M, and then transformed in PM3M. Uh, one thing you can do is to take the homomorphism of G on the corsets by H of G. That means that you write G as being the union of the corsets uh, uh, by H of all the GI which are not in, in H. In our case here, these corsets contain four elements. And the group transform in a permutation group of so four elements. This group is just here. So that means that making, uh, using groups, the first point is that you don't have one which is an international table way of representing uh, space groups, but you have infinitely many, and many are very interesting. I would say even more interesting than the one that are in the international table. Uh, this all, uh, I make a, a little uh, commercial here, this all stuff has been beautifully written by uh, Louis Michel and Morsi Maas. They both are, uh, are past, uh, in 99, Louis Michel. Uh, Louis Michel is a French physicist who, who made important work in high energy physics in the uh, WW0 boson uh, study. Uh, after his work at CERN, he came to Paris to IHS, Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques, and started working very hardly on physics, uh, symmetry in physics. He discovered crystallography as being one of the most extraordinary examples. Uh, 
and he decided to rewrite uh, the fundamental concept of crystallography to n dimension, of course, uh, in four pages using group action theory. This paper is, to my opinion, one of the very basic papers of crystallography. The only problem is that you, this paper is totally unreadable. It's perfect mathematics. There is not uh, one single comma that is uh, superfluous. It's typical Louis Michel. So if you read that, <laughs> you just give up. Uh, it would be very nice, and we are trying to do that with Michel Duneau, to explain this paper in our language. For example, saying that white compositions and orbits is the same. Just that, but it <laughs> would help. Now I go to which space. And which space is well known? We all know that. When you make a structural determination, you determine the space group in reciprocal space. Because, and uh, this was discussed by Bean, Stock, and Ewald long ago. Rediscussed just after by Jeffrey. And more recently, people of the David Mermin group made a series of, of, uh, of papers which, again, I would like to draw to your attention. Uh, the point is the following. Look here, I will discuss only on figures. Look here, this is a so-called eightfold symmetries, I'm uh, symmetries. By the way, if you look at that, it's so, so close from what we see here and in Marrakech or everywhere in Morocco, you have this kind of, of symmetry. You see a symmetry that is eightfold. But if you look at each point where you think you have an A-fold symmetry, you discover that no, you don't. If you turn it by 45 degrees, you will not superimpose. There will be mistakes anywhere, you, from here, from here, from here, etc. But if you now make the Fourier transform, the diffraction pattern of that, you see a perfect, beautiful eightfold symmetry. I hope you do see it because it's, uh, I see it very well here. I don't know how on the, on the uh, so, the first point here, I suspect eightfold symmetry to be present, but it's not exact. There are things which do not superimpose. Here, when I look at this pattern, I do see exact uh, fivefold symmetry, even in the intensities, of course. Another one is this one. You see, this pattern is very nice, again. It's a quasi-periodic pattern, and uh, there are kind of, uh, of of rounds like, like, like circles, uh, but it's not clear which symmetry is there when you look at that. Now you go into your microscope or your FFT transform on your, micro, on, on your uh, computer and you get this. And uh, this is a beautifully 12-fold symmetry. You see it perfectly well. Uh, everything is nicely, does nicely superimpose. Uh, here is another example, even harder, I would say. This is sevenfold symmetry. But I do it, I know that, because I count the number of peaks here, and I say there are 14. Uh, if I look only here, I will have here some kind of a symmetry, but it will not uh, give much of superimposition, this one either. Here, this, you look, something which looks like being 40, 14 uh, fold symmetry, but again, it it's never fits no, nowhere. Here it's perfect. So my point is, as Mermin says, as Binnenstock, as Eval says, as we all say implicitly, symmetry is best defined in reservoir space. That's where we do see things. So the question is, let's, let's, let's play the game. Say, okay, I abandon anything on real space, I will now leave, I put my house in the reciprocal space. What the hell is the symmetry there? I see symmetries, of course. But what does it mean in the real space? To do that, I need to make a little mathematics. Uh, I will define the, the function that is uh, characteristic of the materials as being just a sum of Fourier terms on the uh, reciprocal lattice, lambda star here. This defines the uh, object in re real space. You know that there are uh, very important uh, uh, 
physical properties that's called the correlation functions. For example, the autocorrelation function is the function of intensities is what we have seen before. But you can make correlation function to any order, R1, R2, etc. You take rho of R minus R1 or rho of R minus R2, rho of R minus Rm, and you make the integral. What, what means this integral? Oh, what means this integral? It measures how uh, putting my point uh, to R1, R2, Rn spots, how there will be an overlap between all these. This tells me what the geometric memory is between all these points. Uh, by the way, if I want to make time modern dynamics, for example, I will have to look at average number of, of uh, A atom on a site uh, uh, I, uh, average atom of pairs, average atom of triplets, and so on. So it's, uh, these correlation functions are the function we use to make macroscopical uh, physics. Now the question is, uh, uh, if I take this correlation function, make a Fourier transform, this, each, each one here, each is a, uh, a convolution product, becomes a simple uh, product. And the thing that comes out here is that this integral is non-zero, if this term is non-zero, that means that uh, you have uh, this uh, reducing to all q1, q2, q, etc., qn, such that they form a closed pass. That's classic, huh? uh, nothing, nothing new. <laughs> uh, and the question is, assume that uh, we can make in reciprocal space an operation that uh, satisfies all correlation function to any order. What will happen is structures, which I don't know if they're identical or not, but two structures that are such that for any measurements in physics I will do, I will get the same values from one and the other. We will call that very naturally the indecinability. I cannot distinguish between rho and rho prime. So the question is, uh, when does that happen? First of all, what we say is that for being indecinable, all product rho of q1, etc., qn, and rho prime q1, etc., qn, such that q1 plus q2 plus qn equals zero, all these products must be equal. If they are equal, the two object I am forming by retransforming Fourier are indecinable. So to me, they are equal. I am taking the sense of equality in uh, Galois uh, mathematics, okay? Equivalent. I cannot make difference, so it is the same. Does not mean they are superposed. For example, let's look, there are four important relations. We'll go through like, like uh, a lecture. Uh, first of all, uh, if you calculate the square here, this is, of course, this product, and it must be equal to that for indecinability, so this is that, okay? So what we see is that the two Fourier coefficients, rho and rho prime, they must be changed by a phase factor, just a phase factor. Now, if I go a little bit more, I see that the phase factor, key here, uh, if I take it for minus q, it's minus q of q. Now, if I make an, a new closed close pass, q1, q1, minus q1 plus q2, okay, so I come back, and I rewrite the stuff saying that this must be, uh, this, this product must be equal, then I get this, which tells me something fantastic. Q, uh, chi of q1 plus q2 is chi of q1 plus chi of q2. So we discovered first q is linear, uh, there is a phase, only a phase factor between the two Fourier coefficients. Secondly, this phase factor, look at that, uh, are linear form in Qs. Of course, you have in mind Q square root, uh, Q uh, scalar T. <laughs> now, if you take G and you make exactly the same kind of reasoning using any pass of you want, you will see that uh, you must have these relationships. These, these relationships tell us again that the phase change when you change by a, a rotation, for example, G is a rotation here. Here again, it is uh, linear. This finally tells us that you have J and H, which are two operations in reciprocal space that transform rho, Q1, Q2, etc., in rho prime, and so on then you must have this relationship, this is a group compatibility relationship. Uh, 
And finally, this one, which I will not discuss, is just a gauge invariant, standard gauge invariant way to change the origin. Using that, you say, if the six relations are satisfied in my models, then I will make two objects, n object, any infinity of objects, which are all undistinguishable. Let's go. It's endim crystallography. And one of the fathers of endim crystallography is here. He's Ted, Ted Janssen. He, uh, he was here. Yes, he's here, still. <laughs> uh, and uh, these people made a lot of work, of course. I, I'm sorry, here I should have uh, found the paper by 74, but uh, I could not find the, the reference, but it's, it's not matter. Look what happens here. If you are going in a high dimension, suppose we, we are living in that plane, in that uh, straight line here, we are one-dimensional people, and uh, the crystal we are looking is a two-dimensional crystal. Uh, what we see is the intersection of these lines here with the horizontal line. So we see a point here, a point here is exactly what Ted showed us yesterday, okay? Uh, if you want to make the row function, the one I was interested in, so uh, just imagine you, on each lattice node, the, the lattice is lambda. I don't see if it should be here. And on each lattice node, it does not matter if it's a node or any uh, Wyckoff generalized Wyckoff position, it doesn't matter at all. Here I take the simplest way. Uh, I put this small uh, straight line here, which has uh, a weight h. And to characterize it, I characterize it by a function that takes value one inside and zero everywhere outside. Call it sigma. To get this set of blue, I just have to convolute by lambda. Lambda is a set of delta points at each, each point here. On the, so we get, uh, when you are at that stage here, just here, uh, you get all this set of the blue line, vertical lines. Okay, that's it means. This is the set of the vertical, small vertical segments here. And now I have to take the intersection with that. So it's a simple product. By a, a, a measure, which is here, that takes value one on the, on the line and zero everywhere. So it takes value one of this line and zero perpendicular to, to, to it. And this is the uh, characteristic function of the object I want to look at. Now, if I want to make the Fourier, don't forget I'm interested in the Fourier, I just make some tilde everywhere. Each time there is a, uh, such a, a product here, I put a point, a simple product, and a simple product type on a convolution product. So this is here the function that is uh, a Fourier transform of the heaviside function, double heaviside function, so it's a, a cardinal uh, sinus, is this stuff. Uh, this means, this is very important here, it means that on each point of the uh, reciprocal lattice in two dimensional, you take a sampling of this value. By taking just that, you see that you have points. That means that whatever I do after, uh, what I will see on my diffraction pattern are black peaks, not diffuse scattering. It's not diffuse. There are points. And the points are just say here. And what I do here is just make a, a, a convolution with this object, which is uh, the, the Fourier of that. The Fourier of this is one uh, uh, over parallel space times delta over perpendicular space. You see, it must be delta over parallel space star and one over perpendicular space star, trivial. Uh, so what we do is take the value here, draw a, a, a vertical line, and take the intersection where space where we are. Here is the space. Now if I move that, if I move this object, I move it a little bit, what will happen? Here I will have to convolute that by a delta. Hmm? So that means that here I will multiply each term by exponential those 2 e i pi q uh, t. But t now is a translation of the two-dimensional object. So what comes out beautifully is that uh, the superspace group approach does totally fit the understandability criterion. And the way it does it, it's very simple, that sky is simply q times scalar product. T, T being any, any, any translation in the large space. So what we are saying here is that the 
Yanek and Janssen approach of the gr space groups, the story of the quasi crystals, whatever symmetry, whatever sp large space or not, they, uh, they are based on super space groups, and super space groups are indecidibility groups. What does it mean? It means that if you take a, uh, a structure that comes from one given cut, if you move the cut along per space, it will give the same kind of result. But the two objects will not superimpose. But for us, if we make any kind of physical measurements on this two, I will make, it will make no difference. So that's the, the mo most important point. Super space groups are in disability groups. Uh, if you take any two local isomorphic structures, they have same correlation function to any finite order and therefore physically indistinguishable from each other. Uh, I was talking of eightfold symmetry just before and saying, look, you make the eightfold, it doesn't fit. Yeah, good. But uh, uh, the new object you obtain after eightfold has exactly the same property as the previous object. You cannot make a difference between these two. Or let's say other ways. You have one pattern, I have the other one. And we are communicating by, by smartphone, Apple, of course. And uh, we are trying to explain to each other what we are looking at. So I say, oh, oh I see we had beautiful rosas here with eight objects uh, that are 45 degrees. And they make say, oh, I do see that too. And I say, well, the frequency of that is uh, square two minus something. And you say, well, my, for, my, for me also. And every object I'm looking at, you see the same one. And the frequency of, uh, of measurements of how many of these objects per unit square are they, you will get the same number. So we will finally say, well, we are looking at the same object and not. But we cannot distinguish between these two. Uh, the, the last point, which is very important for statistical physics, is that people working in incommensurate phase and quasi crystals do encounter many phase transformations. And this phase transformation, under the assumption that we are looking at indecidibility group and not at superimposition groups, there are groups to group relations. It's amusing to say that a quasi crystal with five fold symmetry is a supergroup of a cubic M3 symmetry. It is, in that sense. Uh, there are still cases where, even working with the same Z model, even in working, thinking we work on a, uh, in a disability group, the, the, the game does not uh, work. Here are two Penrose tilings. This one, uh, but they have been made in a five dimensional space instead of four. Ted yesterday said us, look, you can take all these, these uh, index, the, the spots and index with four. And here we took five. What happens if we have one additional dimension that may change the isomorphism class? For example, this one and this one, clearly they are different. But they are built in the same Z model with the same tiles. If you look at the uh, electron diffraction, uh, the diffraction pattern, you see that this diffraction and this one is still on the same uh, Z model, but the intensities are not the same. Okay, so we do, we have, I don't know if you do see, I do here, but it's a little difficult. Now, uh, my last point on, on this kind of symmetry, Symmetry of translation. Uh, symmetry of translation has been the golden rule of crystallography since Bragg, since Lowy. Because a crystal was supposed to be a, uh, <laughs> a 3D periodic object. What happens now with uh, this indecidibility? Can we say something about uh, the translation? Are those translations totally lost or not? The answer is they are not. Here you see you have a set of uh, motifs, I would say, like this. Again, they are not exactly the same. They look very much like. Uh, if I turn it by 2 pi divided by 12, I will have the same uh, correlation function. It's symmetry 12, this one. So it's a very amusing, by the way, for you, for Crystal, or first, it's a very amusing tiling. It's a tiling that is uh, a, a strange result of an hexagonal plus a square. Terrible. Okay, and, and you, you get this. So you have squares and you have triangle, uh, equilateral triangles, and it's mixed. It, it, it's 12. Uh, that's very, very amusing object. I like it very. Well, uh, 
what, what is interesting to look at here, I, I, I made a copy of just uh, the vertices uh, and, and the edges of the red here, and exactly the same copy, the blue here. You see this pattern is here. You see this pattern is here, okay? Uh, it's exactly the same, and I moved, so I moved like that. What happens is that infinitely many points do superimpose exactly, but several do not. The, those that do not, I am too, too, too far away to, to look at that, probably here, uh, uh, homogeneously distributed, there are many points that do not superimpose. The big point is that if you take this set of vectors, here there are uh, 24 vectors in, in this small sun here, which I carefully draw. So I have these 24 vectors, and the point is, when you make this translation, you have two solutions. Either you fit with a previously already uh, with a point, everything is fine. Second solution, you do not fit. Uh -huh. So uh, the, the game is, but you are the right of you to using one or several of these 24. If using here, you put it, and using this 24, you come back to the lattice, you say it's okay. Of course, these 24 here are valid for any translation. Any. Uh, for example, here I draw one which was not on top, and I copied this, and of course, it brings me back to the, to the red one. So the formula to, to, to define these sets is uh, very amusing. That's typical math, but uh, I don't know formula much simpler to, to write. It's just, uh, Meyer says, I will call the lambda uh, harmonious ensemble, ensemble harmonieux. Uh, it's in the opposition with ensemble harmonic, harmonic ensemble where it would be periodic, okay? Say, so take this ensemble lambda, translate it, and take the difference, the difference is all the vector that are the difference between these two. And there are two solutions. Either they fit with lambda, the, all the black ones, or if not, using any one of this f, finite, a for finite, finite set of vectors, you come back to, to lambda. Uh, uh, Meyer wrote that in 72, and he, he, he didn't try to make any drawing. Because for us, if you, this is very simple. Either the Patterson, let's call it crystallography, the Patterson function has the same lattice, or it is totally different. We had no idea that the Patterson could be contain the lattice and come back to the lattice up to F, let's say 6, 10, 24 vectors, always the same, okay? It's not 24 that you choose. Once you have a 24, they should always, always do any translation uh, be such that you come back. So that's uh, the, uh, the notion of trans symmetry of translation that is, has been enlarged. Le, the enlargement is here, is that it's almost exactly lambda, but you are right, you can go out, but come on, it must come back with only a few numbers of additional vectors. Now I would like to finish my, my talk with objects that are strange. Uh, uh, it's a substitution tilings. It's very simple. Uh, I take one example here that is very easy. Afterwards, just to finish, I will take one which is not so easy. Uh, here is a square uh, a tri a re triangle with a, a right angle here, and this triangle has length square root two and uh, uh, on, on, on the edge here. It's the so-called uh, square root two tiling. So you have. Uh, what I will do is multiply, two is a golden mean, but actually it does not, not mean much. I will multiply by square root two, so this blue here is here, but it's been changed, okay? And uh, you, you build up a new one, which is square root two smaller. It's a green one. And the rule is the following. When you have a blue, you make this kind of decomposition. You cut it by uh, uh, this perpendicular here. When you have a, a green, you increase it by square root of two, it, it becomes a blue. This becomes a blue. This has been split. This becomes a, a blue. This has been split. This has been split. This has been split. This one becomes a blue. This one becomes a blue. This has been split. You see the, the, the game? Huh? 
That's what you get after a few of those iterations. Very strange object, but still perfectly ordered. It's a crystal. Of course, it is no periodic, but it's a crystal. And uh, to understand what the symmetry is here, I really have to go into reciprocal space. Here is reciprocal space. For those uh, amateur of this kind of uh, pattern you see here, it's exactly like a Penrose tiling pattern, but uh, deformed. You have pentagons here and pentagons here, larger and larger, but of course they are not regular. And what happens here, you see there is a mirror here and a mirror here. So it was absolutely not, not trivial to see that there are two uh, mirrors. Of course, there are indiscernibility mirrors. That means they doesn't superpose exactly, but the correlation functions uh, uh, according to one correlation in one direction and the other, the, in the other direction uh, by MM here are same. My last point, and I will uh, open the questions here, is this, the pinwheel tiling of uh, John Conway. Uh, again, so be very careful with mathematicians. They ask very simple questions, and they are killing. This one is killing. Uh, you take this uh, triangle, which is the simplest possible triangle, is size one, two, and uh, four square root five. You make four copies of this one, you see here, here, here. Now you have a, a, a new triangle, this one I am drawing here, but it's twice larger. Uh, the idea of John, Conway, uh, of John Conway is to say, well, this is size two and this two. So I can put a fifth here. Of course, it will not have the same orientation. It's slightly turned. If I want uh, between this one, starting one, and this one, there is a rotation between these two triangles. This triangle is squared five times uh, in length, square root time five larger, so five times larger. Of course, as crystallographers here, you see, ho oh, oh, there will be a big problem. Because you can do lattices if you multiply by, by four. But if you, you multiply by five, the problem will be really hard. And indeed, uh, if I do that, I, I take now this one, I make the same decomposition. You see, after a while, I get this kind of drawings. Of course, to see it better, I will increase each time by square root 5 to stay to always to the same. Uh, look how it, what it looks like after uh, several, quite many, uh, iterations. It looks like that. You don't see anything. You see straight lines. You, it's perfectly ordered. This object is, a, I would say, a crystal in the sense it's a, a perfectly ordered object, but we, we don't see anything. Of course, the idea is to say, oh, oh, let's go in reciprocal space. Aha. In reciprocal space, let's go. Where? Here is the best I can do with my programs using several, for several with this small object, but several hours of calculation in this. It's terrible. It does simply not diffract. Uh, usually, it diffracts very badly. I have no idea of what it is, uh, well, okay, uh, of, of what it is a symmetry. I don't see anything. If I increase the size, it takes a huge time, and each time the diffraction looks different. It has nothing to do. Uh, mathematicians very recently have calculated, uh, have proved one thing. It's Moody and all at Henri Poincaré. They have uh, proved one thing that the, the diffraction pattern should be uh, perfectly isotropic. Uh, by the way, can you imagine this object I am showing you, it's here, this object is the most perfect power diffraction we can invent. It's a power diffraction, it's perfectly isotropic, it's made with one unique triangle, there is only one kind of triangle into that, it's perfectly coherent everywhere, it fills the space, and it fills the space isotropically in all space, uh, two-dimensional space. So I wanted to really have an idea of what the order was there. Because everything I've told to you until now just fell down. Or is C infinity. C infinity enumerable. Bon, pourquoi pas. Uh, what I wanted, uh, now the triangles, as you have seen, they, they change each time by uh, an angle that is one divided by two, the, 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 the two uh, H's, okay? So it's arctangent one half. And arctangent one half is not commensurate with two pi. That means that you are filling the space, uh, filling the circle, okay? 
so what I did is to give colors to this object. Each triangle now has a color according to uh, its orientation in, in, in the space. And if you choose the colors as astute, you will see beautiful patterns. One of them is uh, the one I like very much, is this one. This is the same object, the one I've shown you before. What you see here is exactly the same object, except uh, now, using colors, we begin to see a beautiful patterning. In that patterning, you see local symmetries. You see local uh, uh, objects that reproduce themselves. So we are now, uh, with this kind of object, with uh, another kind of symmetries, which I don't know how to characterize, which I have no idea how to manipulate. If they are grouped there, finite or not finite, or uh, enumerable or continuous, I don't know. Uh, the Fourier transform does not give any answer to it. So this is my talk, what next, because I don't know. But as you saw, symmetry in, in crystallography, it's not a dead story. It's a story that goes on, goes on, goes on, and mathematicians have taken this. Please, crystallographers, come back. Take that back. It's very important to follow what we are doing. These guys are just fabulous, but you, you need crystallographers to be with them, okay? Else we go into anything. Thank you very much for your attention.